Okay, guys. So the uh, series that will follow this little clip is is a, it's basically the, the the bulk of it is about bridge work on an acoustic guitar. I have um, a Dove project that I'm working on for my buddy Rob, and he uh, it and I you'll see all that in the video. There's a lot going on with this guitar, but where we're at with it now is you know I had to make a new bridge, and um, I start you know I, I thought well. This would be a good time to share some knowledge. And there's, when I was editing the video, getting ready to upload it to uh, YouTube and compile everything together uh, and organize it, I realized there is so much little, so many, so many little bits and pieces of information that aren't really like outlined in the title transitions. So I wanted to kind of go through that with you here at the beginning. And I'm, I'm going to be sure and put some stuff in the comments set, or the uh, overview section on, on, you know, below the video on YouTube to let you guys know that there's some specialized stuff that you're going to see in here. And uh, there's some very specific stuff that, that needs to, you know, I'm going to call your attention to. Um, the removal of the bridge is a very, um, it can be a tricky process. We talk about that in, in, the, in the videos to follow. And re-gluing the, you know, the new bridge or the loose bridge after you remove it, you know, the using hide glue versus the yellow or white glue, aliphatic glue, uh, making a new bridge. Uh, and that's a very uh, involved process, and it's outlined on here from, you know, just a blank or using whatever you have. You may not have an old bridge to pattern the new one after. You may have to find the pattern on the Internet and, you know, trace it out and start from scratch. Um, it, ebony using the proper species of wood, you know, for uh, restorative efforts and keeping everything proper, you know, original specs. Um, the thickness, planing your blank before you cut your pattern out if you're making a new one. I'll go into a little bit more detail in the video um, on that. That's important. Yeah, string spacing. You know, you have, there's so many specifications that you have to know if you're going to make a new bridge. And that's the big one. That's the most important one, really, is like how far apart these bridge pins have, you know, bridge pin holes have to be. You know, next to the, the saddle placement, which I explained that also, your your string spacing is absolutely key when you're making a new, new bridge. And in the situation where you've got the old bridge, well, you're good to go. You can use it as a pattern. And the bulk of that segment of this video, you can just... Or these videos, you can skip that because you've got what you need. Uh, the plate, the bridge plate um, inspection. You know, I I could probably do another video where we get you know video footage of a of like a, a mirror or maybe a snake cam or something up on on the underneath of the guitar, showing how we inspect the bridge plate and what's good, what's bad, when to use a plate mate. You know, uh, these guys, those little brass. Um, plate mates. I explain what they are in, in the videos. I, I absolutely endorse those in my shop and there's not many products that I endorse by name in this shop, but these guys I keep in stock. You know, JLD Bridge Doctor is another one if the bridge is collapsing. We didn't really talk about that a whole lot. Or really, I don't even know if I mentioned it in these videos because that's a separate issue in and of itself. If that bridge is collapsing, you, that bracing needs to be checked the structural integrity of the soundboard needs to be really scrutinized and checked. Um, and we can, I'll do another video, possibly. I, I have other video out there already on Rob's Hummingbird uh, explaining the installation of a bridge doctor. And there's so many other videos out there where these guys are doing it. It's just, it's kind of a, uh, it's arbitrary. And there's no reason to do that now. But if you guys would like to see me do it, I'll be glad to do a video. Let me know. Um, so like I said, you know, coming down the list here, making the bridge, getting it to where you got to glue it using hide glue, uh, the sculpting methods. There's probably a little controversy around, around this uh, little item here and that's fine. Um, it's okay. Cause that's what makes the world go round. Everybody has their own way of doing this. I'll show you guys how, how I do it in my shop. Um, you, you know, safety in, in the shop when talking about sculpting this you know, the bridge is, is a big deal. You guys need to be wearing your PPE. You need to be wearing your respirator and, and some safety glasses. 
possibly earplugs if your ears are sensitive to your power tools, if you're using power tools. Um, with all that being said, there's a few um, specialized tools that I want to kind of throw at you here at the beginning to let you know you're going to see show up in the video. One in particular is the, the saddle slot jig. Um, Steve Mac makes one. Mine's not being totally honest. Mine's not a Steve Mac jig. I got this one. I sourced it from another place. If you guys need information on that, hit me up. I'll be glad to, you know, point you in the right direction. Um, but either one, either, either direction you take, if you're doing this work, you need to go ahead and buy this jig because it's going to, there's no other way to do this. If you're if, to cut a saddle slot proper in a new bridge blank, you need a jig. You can make your own or you can do what this guy did and you can buy one that's pre-made that's adjustable that just works. So, um, hide glue, people, if you can use hide glue, if, if you're scared of it, hit me up. We, we can talk about it. I, I, I can, I can point you in the direction. You can get this stuff so cheap and it will, it will last, you know, in dry form, it will last a very long time. Um, once it's mixed up, if you take proper care and, and re refrigerating it after you, after it's, you know, after it's naturally cooled down from the heated state, that stuff will keep for six, eight months in a, in, you know, after it's mixed up. You don't have to mix up a fresh batch every time. You can, but I've been using the same batch of high glue for months in my shop, and it's still just as strong as it was the day I mixed it up. Use high glue if you can. Uh, yellow glue is great for a lot of things and in get instrument repair and building, but when, it's, when it comes to bridge work, yeah, I absolutely will, will argue with anybody that wants to argue about it that hide glue is the way to go. So I hope you guys enjoy what follows and I just wanted to kind of give you guys an outline of what, what you ex should expect to see in the video um, after the, the first segment's an introduction and kind of an overview of the Dove project and where we're at and where we're going with it. Then we get into the bridge work. So uh, if you guys like it, man, uh, hit the like button, subscribe to my, you know, send me some more subscribers, um, especially people that are into guitar work because uh, that's, the, that's the audience that I want. Um, I, I want people who are interested in this that we can kick knowledge back and forth. Those are the people that I feel like really need to see these videos. Um, but if you know, I hope you enjoy, and uh, thanks for watching. What's up, guys? It's Rick with Baritone Streamworks, and I know it's been a while since we've done any videos or any kind of post or anything, but um, brief explanation on that. Uh, apologies. Uh, I, this is a passion of mine and I do plan on pursuing that. I want to keep a nice uh, presence on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram as much as I, I can. This year has been rough for, for my family. My mother passed away on July 4th and uh, my, my mother-in-law 20 days later. Um, it was, my mom, it was, it was really unexpected. I talked to her four hours before she passed and everything was fine. So, um, not to get all sappy on you guys, but that's not what this is about. But you know, y'all pray for us because it's 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 an adjustment, and it's not been an easy year for anybody. But this year's been especially hard on us. So, and uh, well, we're back at it, and finally, and um, I'm going to do a series of videos here. The, the first one being just an introduction, then touch base with you guys and let you know, yeah, we're still alive, we're still good, um, the shop's still open. If we can help you, you need to amp repair, uh, especially instrument repair, because I'm kind of migrating towards doing more instruments stuff versus I'll, I'll work on amps, but uh, my buddy Charlie Harris here in town, he's, he's the guy for that. I don't care to help you. If, if Charlie can't get to you, come and see me. Uh, but I, I would humbly, you know, just you guys check with him. If it's, if it's something he can handle, then by all means let Charlie do it because he has been doing this for so long um, in this area, and uh, his work speaks for itself. And not that mine's inferior, uh, you know. I'm sure he knows more than I do than I do about amp repair. I, I, I'm a Mesa authorized technician. If you need warranty work done on your Mesa boogie product, come and see me. I'll be glad to handle that. That's a, that's always a good thing. Um, past that, if um, you know, I'm just trying to throw a plug in for him and help him out too. So holler at Charlie, but if, if I can help you come and see me. Um, I have 
got a Gibson Dove on the bench that I'm going to show you guys a few things about today. And on this first video, like I said, it's just an introduction to touch base with you guys and let you guys know that we are still in business and everything's good. So the next video, uh, I'm going to get you caught up to where I am with the work on this instrument. The following video after that, I'm going to get a look or videos after that. Um, I'm going to get a little more in depth as to what we've, what we're doing, uh, and where we're going. So, uh, you guys stay tuned. I'll be right back. Okay, guys, as promised, we're back. And, um, I, like I said, we've got a Gibson dove on the bench that belongs to my buddy, Rob. And he gave this thing to me here, uh, months ago to work on. He's just like, man, if you can fix it, fix it and no rush. And I'm so glad it was like that because like I said, it's been a crazy year. So without any further ado, this is, this is the dove. And I know things look kind of well, I out of sorts here. I've got a lot going on on the bench right now. I apologize for that. Uh, later on, what I plan on doing is getting rid of that guy. He's well, not getting rid of it. It's going out in the garage. I'm going to have a nice little Kennedy toolbox sitting over here that I bought from my buddy Tyler Hankins. And I'm going to sort all these tools out and get them over here where I can just reach and grab them. And I'm going to build another bench similar to this one. Uh, you know, this bench here, maybe some shelving on this side of the, the shop. So I'll have a little more workspace and <laughs> get all this chaos sorted out. So, But this thing came with a Heritage Cherry finish on it, which I absolutely hate. And... Uh, Rob seems to share the same sentiment as me on that. So I'm going to refinish it. What we're shooting for is more of a tobacco burst finish like the mandolin up here has that belong to my grandpa. And it should turn out nice. It'll be beautiful. Um, I'm, I got some ideas. And the reason I say that is because I've got to hide a lot of this trauma around this neck area. And uh, traditionally speaking, your tobacco burst finishes are nice and dark through here. So that's the reason I'm wanting to go with that. It'll, it'll hide that uh, really well. Uh, as far as where we've, you know, where we've been first and foremost, neck reset. It was absolutely essential for me to get a neck reset on this guy. There was no way that I could make this instrument play the way I wanted it to play with this bridge, which I am changing the bridge also. You can see I've got a new bridge on here that I've, that I've made and I'm in the process of sculpting it. Let me see if I can get that wing. See how it's tapered off to the end down there? It goes from thick down to thin. And I'm gonna make these sides somewhat symmetrical. Um, I'll do the best I can by hand. I'm doing all that by hand. It's all, it's all been handmade and I'm gonna go into depth on that either. I'll probably do that on the next video, so. But full neck reset, full refret, uh, new binding on the neck. Um, and it's nice and glued up. Um, yeah, just stripped it down, did the neck reset, refret, and that was weeks worth of work. Um, when you're doing the neck reset, when you steam these necks, you kind of have to give them some time to dry. That wood needs to dry, get as dry as you can get it, you know, within reason. We keep things, I'll show you my hygrometer. We keep things in the shop as close to 50% as I can keep it. Cause 50 to 55% is where these instruments want to be. So we try to do it right here. And I let these things set and dry for about a week, uh, at minimum a week before I, before I start messing with them. That way I know that there's no, <laughs> extra moisture locked into the, the dovetail or the tenon of the joint, the, the pocket of the joint, you know, I want to make sure it's nice and dry. So that's where we're at. She's glued back together and the geometry's coming together is not, is a lot nicer than I expected it to. Um, not as nice as I would hope in all honesty, but, um, it's going to, it's as good as I can get it. And, um, that's, that's where we're at with it. So the next video, I'm going to go a little more in depth as, as far as, um, the bridge making process. The neck reset process is something that I really want to do a separate video on another instrument that needs one from start to finish. And I prefer it be like a Martin guitar um, versus um, a Gibson or, you know, Taylor, which <laughs> Taylors are easy because they're actually, it's a bolt system on those and you just have to get shims and shim, shim the neck and get your angle where you want it and bolt it back down. You're good to go. There's no glue involved um, on, on most of them. Not a little caveat there. Some of their models are are are, are not um, that cut and dry. So 
the uh, the process on the neck reset is pretty time intensive. Um, there's a lot going on there, and I, I feel like it deserves a, a completely separate series of videos. Um, for people who haven't done it before, you need to know how wh where you're going with the neck. The whole process needs to be outlined in as much of a step-by-step -step fashion as it can be. Uh, they're all a little different. Now you guys have heard me say this before, and I, I will. All, I'm gonna I'm gonna preach this just about on every series of videos. And every time a customer comes in my shop, I tell them, "Look, every guitar in this shop, it might be a PRS product, you know, but they're all different. They're they're all, in my opinion, they're living, breathing organisms. Almost they all move differently. I've had two Stratocasters made the exact same Stratocasters in my shop at the same time." The same production run made on the same day, the same factory, the same materials. And I, I, I'm telling you guys that I had to work the setups on those. Just It, it might have been just slightly different, but it was different enough to me to where I was like, man, that's a substantial difference. One of those guitars was the lowest setup I was ever, ever able to get on uh, an electric guitar, like ever. Like I was never, I've never been able to get an instrument playing that good uh, since then. And it pains me to say that because me and Fender have a love-hate relationship, uh, so to speak. Um, I'm a PRS guy through and through. I like Gibson stuff too. These are my preferences. I'll work on anything. I can work on just about anything. I've worked on like handmade pieces and and done setup work on on you know custom-made stuff for people and you know, like Sur guitars, um, Warrior guitars, man. Beautiful instruments, just insanely crafted instruments. Ernie Ball Music Man stuff. I mean, stuff that you know is just top of the line stuff, handmade stuff. And I've done setup work on that to get get it where the customer wants it. But I prefer PRS. They feel good to me. Everybody's got their own thing. So I know I'm off on a tangent there, but what I'm trying to say is every one of these guitars has to be looked at from a repair standpoint or a technician standpoint, a luthier standpoint with a subjective set of eyes, a really subjective set of eyes, they're all different. So uh, preconceptions have to go out the window when you walk through this door. We're gonna do what we can with that living, breathing guitar, that individual little piece, and we're gonna get it as good as it can be before it leaves the shop. If it, you know, it, it's gonna be as good as it can be when it leaves my shop. I, that's a personal guarantee that I've given everybody since I've been doing this. and. No, I don't, not one customer has had anything contrary to say about that. So um, the next video will be on bridge work, making a new bridge, gluing a bridge. Um, and uh, after that, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll just see where the conversation takes us. But stay tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs> okay, guys. So bridge work. What is, a, what is a bridge? What's the function of a bridge, right? This was the bridge that was on this dove when I got it. Look how thin these, I mean, in the middle. I know it looks really thin on the edge, and it is, but believe it or not, that's that's okay. It's actually okay for that to be that thin. This is a brand new bridge. This guy hasn't been shaved. It's just manufactured rosewood. I got it from Stuart McDonald uh, for another another job. It was actually a set of two that I got. I, I ordered two different ones is what it was because I wasn't sure how the customer felt about the measurements on one versus the other and uh, you know all that stuff. But he wound up going with the other bridge and now I've got this one left for another job. So, But look how thick that is in the middle compared to that guy. I mean, you can visually see the difference. It's just this, this thing's been shaved and shaved and shaved. And you can even see, if you look real close, where the old saddle slot used to be and I filled it in with ebony, which that's proper. And I know why they did it this way. It's because the intonation wasn't right on the instrument. Intonation and bridges are hand in hand. Intonation on an instrument is defined as, um, or it, intonation is a product of, let me back up. Intonation is a product of knowing the scale length of your instrument and, and the saddle and the nut being placed in a proper position on the on the instrument. Your scale length of your instrument is the takeoff point on the nut to the takeoff point on the saddle. The takeoff point is where the string comes up and over and leaves that little edge where it leaves the nut and where it leaves the saddle. 
that measurement is your scale length of your, of your instrument. And the way that you, there's an easy way to determine that. I cheat a little bit. I use, when I'm doing this kind of work, I use the Stuart McDonald saddle mag and it takes all the guesswork out, guys. I know where my nut slot's at. That's not moving. That's, it's there. That's a factory nut slot. There's no reason to mess with that. It's where it's supposed to be. Um, I lay that guy, that little foot, that little grooved, let's see if I can get the groove in there. That goes on the 12th fret. This gets adjusted up and down. See that? I'm just, this can move in and out. I adjust this up to the nut slot. I'm right even flush with the nut slot. And it has little pins on it you can use for prescribing where your, your saddle slot goes. But when I get up here on the nut end of the, of the, you know, the headstock, I take a square, you know, I got a little square here and I square this guy up with the nut shelf, you know, the, the, in the nut slot. I make sure it's there and I tighten this down and it's real easy. You flip it around, you set it back down on the 12th fret. Now you can scribe some little marks, some little score marks with these pins where your saddle slot's got to go. Now, if you don't have one of these, and I didn't for a long time, it's, it's fine. No, no big deal. What you have to do is you have to take a straight edge with measurement on it. And I, and I apologize. I know this video is showing everything inverted because I'm using the front facing camera, but I need to be able to see myself when I'm doing these videos. Otherwise, I don't know, you know, I don't know what the frame of reference is. So well, I hope to fix that. I hope to get a GoPro and hook it up to my MacBook and all that later on where I can do this almost in like real time. Um, I'm going to work on that. I, you know, you got my word on that. I don't know when, but it'll happen. Um, so you got to have a straight edge and you'll just take, square it up with the nut slot, just like we did with the saddle mannequin. and you'll take a measurement at the crown of the 12th fret. And you need to be as pre precise as you can be. Precision is everything with this because if, it it can be fixed. Like if you're if you're just a few thousand, or I don't want to use the thousands is, is what luthiers like to work in thousands of an inch as much as they can. But when we're doing stuff like this, sixty fourths of an inch makes more sense. Um, Thirty seconds. You need to be within a couple sixty fourths of where you know you think you need to be with this measurement, and double and triple check it, and then just double the measurement. You know, flip flip this guy over. Put it on the 12th fret, get it as close to the crown as you can, make your mark, you know, for each of the individual string paths. Now, now let me reiterate that. Now, when you go to the saddle end, you need to be dealing with individual string paths to lay out your line. You'll have a series of six little individual marks, and then you're going to use a straight edge and mark a line across those marks. And that's the, that's the path of the saddle, okay? Once the saddle is in the slot, you can adjust forward or backward with a file to in, in, to get proper intonation. You know, this is a tusk saddle and they come manufactured like this, but look, you see how it has like, let me back up here. It has a, a edge here that's going that way for the B string. Then the high E is that way. And then the G is that way. And the D is a little less that way. And the A is a little less that way. And, and the, then the low E is a little less that way. It's like it tapers off. It's almost like a Sonny always told me, he said, when you're looking at like um, uh, setting preset intonation, kind of roughing it in, it, you should almost visualize the way a piano looks, like how the strings kind of stagger. You know, it's almost staggered to a certain extent. You can't just lay a staggered pattern out there and mark it and call it good, but that's the visual. It's like staggered from the B string back to the, you know, the low E, it's staggered. So you can you can adjust your intonation by filing that takeoff point forward or backwards so so getting back to making the bridge okay so now that you guys understand the scale length measurement how to get it get yourself a saddle matic save yourself the headaches they're not that expensive it's it's in the long and short if you're going to be doing this if you do more than one of these it'll pay for itself guaranteed you know these things they're awesome so um you if you've got a pre-manufactured saddle to replace, like most, a lot of guitars, you know, the mid-grade, mid to high-grade guitars will have rosewood. 
And even some of the higher end guitars will have really ornate inlaid rosewood or just rosewood or a special species of rosewood that was a select cut of wood. You can use rosewood and get them pre-made and bam, you're done. You know, you use your bridge pins, line this guy up once you get the old one off, um, glue this guy in, use good hot hide glue. Uh, use hide glue, I'm gonna say it again, use hide glue for this. Don't use yellow glue. Um, you'll thank me later. I, I could do a whole other video on, on the advantages of hide glue over any other glue for instrument making, but I'm not gonna get into that. That's a big debate usually, and I'm just, that's my preference. I'm just giving you my knowledge is all I can do, is make suggestions. You can take it and run with it, or you can do the trial and error on your own. I've used yellow glue for bridges before, I didn't like the results that I got at times. The yellow glue tends to make wood swell. It's got a lot of water in it, so it it just is different animal. It's a you know, trust me on this. So when you have to make one though, like in this case I did, this is ebony. And I can get ebony bridges like this all day long. I even went as far as to call Gibson guitars. And yeah, I'm gonna throw a little shade at these guys right now. This is one of the things about corporate people that I don't like. If I were to call up PRS or Taylor and say, hey, will you sell me just a saddle? Or I'm uh, not a saddle, a bridge. Um, they might be a little hesitant at first, but if I were to explain the situation to them, I, would, I feel pretty confident that this is being an heirloom piece, that it needs to be as original as it can be. It wouldn't matter to me or the customer if it was three hundred dollars for that for that bridge. If I wanted it, I could probably get it. But with Gibson, they weren't having it, man. Now, they were not going to sell me a Dove bridge. They would not do that. They wouldn't sell me this guy, and I don't know why. And I couldn't find one of these on the internet anywhere that was made out of ebony. I can find these all day long made out of rosewood that looks just like. Well, the, the pattern of this, I'll say that. Um, but that's just, in my shop, that's good. It's not going to cut it. It needs to be original, if it can be original. Because this, this is all about preserving the instrument as much as we can now. Somebody's probably watching this video and going, well, well Rick, man, you've stripped this thing down. All the, all the, all the value's gone. And, you know, it's not worth, ever going to be worth what it was originally. Maybe not to you and me. But to this customer, it means, like, this guy, I know this guy like the back of my hand. Um, I've told people off and on through the years about Rob and, and like, our history together. And um, I've known him since we were just children. And I'll, just to kind of showcase how, how much I know him, without even asking him if he wanted me to, I was like, hey, man, this pit guard, come off this guy, it's broken. And he was like, so? I was like, well, man, I can get you a new one. He's like, no. He said, glue that sucker back. Make it work. He says, I, I want the old, as much of the old on this instrument as I can keep. I, I like, I mean, he wants it to have character. And I knew that. But I went through the paces of asking him just just to be on the safe side. I could have saved myself that phone call. And I, and I told my wife before I called him, I was like, he's going to want that old pit card. And she was like, yeah. So I'm going to call him just to see. He may, Maybe he feels a little different this time. No. No, he's a he's a he's a, um, a traditional kind of guy. He has a he has an affinity for um, the collectible aspect of things. So the the the, the intrinsic value, if you will, the, the stories that this thing can tell if it could talk. So um, with that being said, that's why I said no. I'm gonna go with we're going with ebony. We're gonna I'm gonna make this guy an ebony bridge. I've done I've made bridges before. It's not a big deal. So I hit Mac up. Got a few ebony blanks, and this is the same species that this is. I mean, you can look at the wood and tell they're the same wood. See the see the grain lines and stuff. How that? I mean, it's, it's still it's the same species of ebony. So these come to a set thickness, right? And um, you have to plane them down. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna break right here. And just we'll make another video just to keep these videos brief and short, and that way I'll know they'll upload right. When we come back, I'm going to walk you guys through the process of making one of these saddles uh, and from a blank versus just gluing on one of these guys, okay? So stay tuned. We'll be right back. All right, guys. So as stated before, making a new ebony bridge. 
If you've got the old one to make a pattern out of, that's great. And you can just take a piece of soapstone or I mean, lead pen. I, I like soapstone on the ebony because I can see it a little better. It's it's it just it, it my eyes aren't what they used to be, so I have to do what I have to do. Um, you can make your pattern out on here. Uh, you can cut it out, but you got to plane it first. So pay attention here. This is important. You got to have this plane to the right thickness first. Um, not saying you can't. I have actually, and my father-in-law, if he was here, he witnessed it. I have cut one of these out on a, one of these blanks. I've actually, you know, marked it out as a pattern, cut it out on the scroll saw, and then I've planed it. But let me tell you, that's treacherous territory there. You're playing with fire. Those planers, those, those electric planers, those knife edges, when they come around, they're humming, man. I don't know how many RPMs that thing's spinning at, but if it ever grabs that wood and slings it, God forbid anybody standing in front of it or it's in front of a car or, you know, there's all kinds of bad ways that that could go, but you can kind of visualize where I'm going with this. This becomes a, a wood bullet, basically. So safety first, plane this guy first, then scroll saw it out or coping saw. And on that note, you don't always have to have like really expensive tooling to do this. This is like a, it's a Husky brand coping saw I've had for years from Home Depot. I used to use it for running crown mold and trim and stuff. And I would always coke my joints to make them nice and tight. And once I started doing this, I was like, hey, I could use this in the shop now. So I just brought it in here, started using it for things like this. I use it for a lot of different things, but especially making these weird little intricate cuts where I've got to, I've got to be able to just ease and go around really nice and slow. These things have a lot of teeth on them and you can get them. I think they go up to 28 teeth per inch or something on the coping saw. Um, a jeweler saw is even better if you can get your hands on one of those. Um, I've got to get one of those for doing inlay work anyhow pretty soon. So uh, another video, maybe I can show you guys my jeweler saw jig and inlay work jig. And yeah, we'll get into that. But you can use a coping saw. you got to cut it out to the pattern uh, after you plane it. And the way that you check your thickness, get yourself a little caliper. I mean, you can buy one from, from Harbor Freight, man. I, I literally like it's, I think this guy was under 10 bucks with a coupon. I mean, it's, and they're accurate enough, you know. You're just getting an estimate of what the thickness of that piece of wood is, right? So it doesn't have to be like super accurate, but I like this caliper for a lot of my guitar. This is a Luthier's caliper. And you'll notice that little notch right there that's really handy for measuring fret height. I don't have to estimate with hooter gauges anymore. I know I know what it is with this, just that quick. I set this on a piece of granite that I know is flat. I zero it out, and then um, I push, it, put, push this down on top of the, the, the crown of the fret, and it'll read uh, a negative measurement, which represents thousandths of an inch crown height. So anyhow, caliper. This piece, this blank from Stumac is I always like to average it out. I like to get a few measurements like this is 11 30 seconds of an inch thick according to this guy. This does, this does fractions too and I think I moved it a little bit you can see but it, in just inches we're looking at 0.539 0.5, might as well say 540, um, and you know, that's 11, 30 seconds. So, well, you know, if you know what your measurement is to start with, you can watch the progress as you go by passing it through the planer and lots of small, just tiny little increments. You never want to hog off a bunch with, I mean, that planer will do it. You know, a power planer will, will eat through wood at whatever rate you want it to pretty much. I mean, Especially when you're talking little pieces like this, it'll chew it up. It don't care. Um, go slow, take your time, small increments, and get it down to the thickness that you want. Um, the measurements vary on the specs for bridge thickness and you know what they call bridge height. And uh, I'm thinking on this guy, I went with. I've got it roped down somewhere. I just don't remember where I put it. I don't, I don't remember where I put his measurements at. Um, but you can, essentially what you can do, you can go to the internet and you can look up the specs on the guitar. 
It'll tell you the scale length, nut width, uh, nut action, relief, string height measurements for low end, high end, the 12th or the 15th fret, depending on how they measure it. Um, uh, it'll tell you the type of fret wire that's used, I mean, everything about the guitar. And that bridge height measurement's one of those spec measurements. And if you can match the original manufacturer's measurements on that, it makes your life a lot easier. Because then you know you're starting from, from square one, you know. And uh, now this, in this particular case, on this particular guitar, this bridge had to be, I had to do the bridge re uh, removal and uh, had to make a new bridge and get it glued prior to getting the next set because your next set measurement is taking off. You, you measure that from the top edge of the bridge, um, essentially. The, the sweet spot for the end result, we'll say it like that. The end result that you want is when this thing's all set, when everything's all said and done, strings are on, it's tuned to pitch, you should be able to take a ruler and measure from the top of the soundboard to the bottom of the strings in the middle of the bridge. Um, Cause that's a good average place to be in the radius. We're, we're talking about the radius of a guitar right now, or visualize that the radius at the bridge. That's the peak of the radius. Half an inch is what you want between the soundboard and the bottom of the string. If you don't have a half an inch there, that instrument is not gonna project. People talk about how loud and boomy Martin guitars are. It's because that measurement's always on point. Those things are loud for a number of reasons. The bracing systems, the woods that are used, the gluing and clamping techniques that they use for the overall construction. Um, Martins are a rigid instrument. They're built solid. The bracing is awesome. That, that, that X bracing system is, um, it's a pretty much industry standard now. Martin broke the mold with that years ago and that's what everybody kind of goes off of for, for the most part is that design. A scalloped X brace, modified scalloped X brace, if I could go on, but you get my point. And that measurement, half an inch has to be there. So taking all this information, putting it together, the bridge is glued on and you set the neck. Now, normally, in the normal situation, you're just going to be replacing the bridge. If you're watching this video and you're trying to, to glean any kind of information from this, that, that's probably what you're wanting to know is, well, okay, step by step. Well, you have to heat the bridge up. There's a lot of different methods for doing that. Heat, heat lamps are a really good one, but you have to use a reflective shield to keep the heat from messing with the finish on the top of the guitar. you got to heat that bridge. I prefer to use a number of things depending on how stubborn the bridge is. This guy came off with relative ease. I didn't have to do, I mean, you know, there's still some glue left on that. I mean, that's how clean it came off. You know, it's it, it was ready to come off. This thing was just hanging by a thread. But some of them are really stubborn, man. And you gotta know how to read the grain of the wood. When you're looking at the top of a guitar, when you're looking at the top of a guitar, you'll notice that and the light's gonna mess with us here, but just bear with me here, folks. Like right through here, that's the center line on the guitar. That's where, this is actually two pieces of wood. That's not one piece of wood. That's two pieces of wood that have been glued together end to end. It's book match. They take a piece of wood, let's say that, you know, use this for an example. They'll take this piece of wood and they'll run it through a bandsaw right in the middle. They got their little jig made up to where it's nice and tight. So the saw is calibrated, ready to go. They run it through there, and once it's done, you open it up like a book. That's why they call it book matching. Now you have whatever figuring you had in the wood that went all the way through the grain, now it's a mirror image of, of, of each other. And that's how these beautiful ornate tops come, come together. I'll walk you over here to my Tremonti model and kind of give you an example of that. PRS, man, these guys, they're, one of the things that I love about them is their ability to capture just the life in the wood. If you pay close attention to this spalting right, right through here on this, well, there it is over there. There's your center line. Look real close here. That is where that piece of wood was book matched. It's a piece of maple. and I, I don't know what grade maple, probably quadruple or higher flame maple, they book matched it and they glued it together. So you open it up, glue it together like this. So it goes from one piece of wood to two, you know. Now, why did I say all that? You have to know how to read the grain lines. When they're glued together, 
um, a lot of times they won't go like this. They'll go like this or, you know, they may even go end to end like this. And that's pretty common actually. Well, look what's happening now. Now you've got grain running in this direction and this direction or the other way. You've got it running in this direction, this direction. So those, you have to know how to read the grain in the wood in order to, to know which direction to pry the bridge up from because if not, you're gonna be fighting the grain and you will gouge the top of that guitar. You'll pull big old chunks of wood out. This guy knows because I did this for years and then I finally was taught the right way to do it. And then, I mean, that's how we learn um, trial and error, you know, for the most part. Sonny was big on that. He's like, man, the only way you're going to know how to do this is just to get, get your hands on it, youngin'. You say youngin'. Get your hands on it, youngin', and do it. So that's what I did. I buy cheap guitars, tear them apart, put them back together. Give them to a friend or something. I, I just did it for fun. So um, anyhow, you got to get that bridge off of there as cleanly as you can. Then you got to clean all that old glue off as much as you can. Now, a really important point here on making the bridge contact the top of the guitar properly. The top of a guitar is not flat. It is, it has a little bit of a radius to it. Every, once again, you can look those measurements up. If, if you look up the manufacturer's specs for that guitar, that it will tell you what the radius is, okay? But it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's nice to know for note, keeping purposes in case you may need to know one of these days, but for this purpose, you don't really have to. All you do is you take a piece of sandpaper, whatever grit you want. Uh, I usually, in, in this case, I prefer the to use the, the, the mindset that less is more. I don't want to, I never want to take off more than I absolutely have to on any of this stuff. So, I go with like a 320, 400 grit sandpaper, and if that's just too smooth, then I'll back back down. I err to the side of taking off less material anytime I can and work it nice and slow. There's no reason to be in a hurry with this stuff. I mean, it's, you know, quality results, it takes time. So you lay a piece of sandpaper where the bridge would be and it has to be nice and flat and you can tape it on the top of the guitar, that's acceptable. And you take your bridge and you work that bridge back and forth ever so slightly, but in a, you have to follow, like, you need to be perpen, uh, parallel to the frets. Work it back and forth. And what that's gonna do is gonna, it's gonna sand that radius into the contact surface of the bridge. That way, when you go to glue it up, there's no air gaps, there's no, you're gonna get a nice little squeeze out of glue all the way around that bridge. The, the, the way you tell if you've got your bridge glued properly when you clamp it up, glue should run out all the way around. And and people can say what they want, but I'm gonna tell you what I think. You're better off having a mess of glue to clean up at that moment, at that moment that you clamp that up, you would be better off that you have to clean up a lot of glue versus not having enough glue. Not having enough glue is just gonna put you right back where you started when you throw strings on that guy. So, you know, take it from me, I've been there and I've done it. So make sure that you've got adequate glue. Now, I wouldn't say go completely bonkers and, you know, put a quarter of an inch pile of glue on, on the bridge. And I mean, there's no sense in being that silly with it, but get, you know, get it coated. Another little step that you can take after you've sanded the radius on the bottom of this uh, bridge blank is you can score this with a razor knife in an X pattern, and that will help the glue pull the wood fibers together as it's drying. It gives it something to bite. Um, high, hot, high glue is the only way to go. I'm gonna do a whole other video showing you guys my high glue setup and how I use it and how quick you have to work with high glue. You can't mess around. You got, at best, 30 seconds to get everything clamped up, wiped up, and done once you've glued those surfaces together. I mean, that's how fast high glue starts gelling up. If it ever starts gelling on you before you got it completely clamped, you better pull it back off, clean it off, and start over with a fresh coat of high glue because you're going you're gonna to fight with it. It's not going to stick. Um, hot, hot high glue. Why hot, hot, hot high glue? I get that question a lot. Hot high glue, it's traditional. It's, it, was, it, it was originally the only form of glues that we ever had were animal protein glues. Um, as macabre and as morbid as it is, um, you know, the old saying, you know, the horse gets 
a lame leg or something, well, we're sending them to the glue factory. Well, folks, that's what they did. They made they made glue out of horse hide proteins. So that's it. That's essentially what it is. It's an animal protein based glue, and it's traditional. It has a very nice tonal characteristic to it. The stuff is hard. It's hard and brittle, kind of like a. I almost want to say like glass would be when it's when it's completely dried and carried out. And but the most important thing is, high glue works differently than yellow glue does as it's drying. It has a tractive effort. Like it, it. I've heard people say, well, it's a mechanical bond, and I believe that. I believe it's actually a mechanical gripping bond between the glued surfaces versus a chemical reaction like you would have with epoxies or super glue or you know you know ca glue or whatever um yellow glue another good option but i would never use that on a bridge glue up myself i have many many uses for yellow glue in my shop and if i ever start building lord knows i'm going to be going through gallons of it in the construction of the instrument but when it comes to the neck and the bridge on an acoustic guitar I'm using I'm using hide glue. Now a fretboard, if I glue a fretboard on, um, I'm probably not going to use hide glue because I don't. There's not enough working time there. A fretboard has to be glued and aligned. You have to work it down as you go. Um, some people even drill you know holes and use alignment pins on opposite corners of the fretboard just to make sure it's where they want it at. You know, there's lots of different ways to do that, and you might be able to use hide glue in that situation. I can't personally get the hide glue applied to a long stretch of fretboard and then get it glued and clamped in time. I haven't I haven't devised a way to do that quick enough, so I'll stick with yellow glue for that. But the, the bridge and the neck's gonna get high glue. So, just a quick recap on this portion. You take, if you're just changing the bridge, heat that joker up and get it off there. Um, watch your grain lines. I mean, you can use stuff out of the kitchen, man. I go to these little antique stores, I buy stuff. I'm not kidding, guys. I mean, stuff like stuff you'd use to make cakes with, uh, you know, old, old butter knives. I mean, you know, just ridiculousness, really. This, but it's you know, it's stuff that, that you can get up under the up under the bridge with and pry it loose. Um, feel free to heat them up. Take it. Take a, a lighter, or if you got an oil lamp, an oil lamp's a really good option. Heat gun. Heat. Heat the spatula. Heat your knife. And kind of work it in there a little at a time. Take your time. Go slow, super slow, slow, just super slow. And pay attention to your grain lines. And you'll have a fun, it's, it's fun. Um, I think it's fun. And the results are awesome. Man, when you, when you got a guitar, it needs a new bridge. And you, or it's a bridge that's coming loose. And you pop it off, re-glue it. And you see your work. And man, it's a beautiful thing. Um, if you're making one, you got to have a blank. You got to plane that blank first to the thickness that you want. Use the old one if you've got it for a pattern. If you can't, you can get them off the internet. You can print them out. There's printable patterns that you can use to tape on here and then trace out your pattern. Pattern it out, cut it out on the scroll saw, glue it onto the guitar like this guy is right now. Okay, that's where we're at. Now the next step, which I'm gonna go into depth on on the next portion is um, cutting the saddle slot, the bridge pin holes, um, and uh, I'll reiterate how we glue these on, how I prefer to glue them on, uh, and then we'll get into sculpting the bridge, and that's going to be it for bridges, so stay tuned. Okay, guys, so we've got our, we've got our bridge glued to the guitar, and you're going to have to pretend for a minute, uh, because the examples that I've got to show you here, they're kind of a little bit ahead of the the curve in the process from, from where I'm speaking right now, if that makes sense. Normally you wouldn't have this saddle slot. You wouldn't have these, uh, bridge pin holes in here. So dealing with the holes first, man, just use the old one as a pattern. That's your string spacing. Uh, if you don't, if the old one's disintegrated, blown into pieces, whatever, you'll have holes in this, in the soundboard of the guitar to get your spacing by. If you, if for whatever reason you're in, you, you're in a bad situation, <laughs> To where you're actually having to come up with that measurement on your own here's what you do you can um get these these the the bridge pin spacing from the specs of the you know the manufacturer's specs uh that's the best way to do it 
um, you can you can go to like Gibson guitars, PRS guitars, you know Taylor guitars, Martin guitars. Look up that model guitar, and somewhere along the lines, even if you have to dig through the forums a little bit, you know, uh, crawl on the forums online, you'll be able to get that measurement. Um, this measurement, there's a set measurement based on each model of the guitar. I use a product in my shop called Plate Mate for a lot of uh, bridge plate repairs. Uh, on the inside of the guitar, on the you know the under underside, if you will, of the soundboard, there's a there's a like a trapezoidal piece of wood in there, and that's for a contact point for the ball ends of the strings when, when they're pulled up against the soundboard of the guitar. Basically, it's just a, a piece of wood that's there to give that a little reinforcement. Over time, those wear, they, they go from being shaped like these little guys here to just gnarled up and gone. The next time that I have one come in my shop that has a bad bridge plate, I'm gonna pull it out and keep it to, to show everybody as an example of what a bad bridge bridge plate looks like. But these guys, Mitchell's Plate Mate, I don't endorse a lot of products in my shop. I re, I'm not that kind of guy. Um, I'm not real brand loyal on, on a lot of things. When it comes to guitars, I'm, I'm brand loyal, but like products for guitars, I can, I, you know, people bring whatever strings, I can use whatever. I prefer to use the Adario strings on electrics. I prefer to use either Deodario or Elixir on acoustics. Um, but I, I can use anything that the customer wants to use. It's not that big a deal. With that being said, this is a life-saving device as far as these guys are concerned. This saves, this little $25 um, plate mate can save you, if you're my customer, this can save you hundreds of dollars in bridge plate, you know, bridge plate repairs, uh, down the road, or even a busted top on your guitar, God forbid. Um, if yours is starting to get worn, hit me up. I'll, I'll get you in touch with these people. I can send you, you know, you go to their website and order direct directly from them. Um, or, um, you can call them up. They're really easy to deal with. I keep them in my shop. If you need me to install it for you, I can, but it's really pretty self-explanatory. The back side of this thing has 3M uh, adhesive on it. I usually supplement that with a little bit of glue of my own because I want this thing to stay there once it's there. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because if you'll notice, if I can get this sticker to play nice in here, uh, there's a lot of different string spacing measurements like down through here in the list. Now, I know it's all backwards because we're looking at the front facing camera, but you've got Two inch, two and a sixteenth, two and an eighth, two and five thirty seconds, two and three sixteenths, two and a quarter, two and five, on and so on and so forth. Your standard Martin measurement's two and an eighth of an inch. Um, I believe this one was something closer to. It was a. It was different. This this measurement was different. I had it. I've got to find my sheet where I've got all this wrote down on this guitar. But just suffice it to say, I've got to get a different plate mate for this guy because his bridge plates messed up on here a little bit and I, I he prefers to have that on there when it leaves here just so he doesn't have to worry about it later on and i don't blame him um that's a you know you can the way you measure it you'll take your little measurement device um whatever you're using everybody's got their own way of doing it and you know you can go from the middle of the low E to the middle of the high E, and this, yeah, this guy's a two inch measurement. So I've got to get a two inch spacing plate mate for this one. And uh, let me see if I can get you a little closer to that. I'm gonna try to lay that on there and tape it so you guys can see it on the camera real quick. I should have, guess I should have been a little better prepared for this because I, I kind of just thought about this at the last minute. I was like, hey, I need to show these guys what the plate mates are and how they work. So this way you can kind of see you're in the middle here and you're in the middle here is your measurement and that two inch mark is right in the middle of that bridge pin slot so it's a two inch spacing on this dove based on the holes that are already on the guitar now i don't know if that matches the spec from the factory but i don't really care to be brutally honest because that's what we're going to go with um whatever's here's on this guitar is what i'm going to work with and uh so we've got the the you know you know once you know the spacing um, before you glue your bridge, you can take your, your bridge over to the drill press and you know you mark your holes and pop them. It's a super simple process. You can do it by hand. Put it, jig it up in a vise, 
you know, step through your bits a size at a time. Start with a small one, work work your way up to a bigger bit. This isn't even the size it needs to be. This is these holes are smaller than they need to be for the bridge pins. I always go small, and then when it gets close to time, like when I get ready to put my strings in, I use a tapered reamer, and I ream these out by hand, like so, until the until the bridge pins fit. You know, like a. You guys can see <laughs> how tall that joker's standing up there. I mean, it's like a an inch or so. So I do that on purpose, though, because that's the way I prefer to do it. I want my bridge pins to be as tight as they can be on my bridges when they leave my shop. I don't like bridges that bridge pins that are just you know that that just creates all kinds of headaches. Uh, I also cut ramps into the slots with a little saw that I've made right here. Um, so the strings can set into that, there's a, into the ramp, uh, slot. Technically speaking, when I'm done with the bridge, you can almost, in most cases, you can almost pull the pins out and the strings won't come out once it's tuned to pitch. That's proper work. That string should be there on its own. That bridge pin is just there to keep that ball in from coming out of that slot. It's not, that's it. It's not there to hold the string in. It's not any of that. It's just there to keep the ball in from kicking out of that slot and coming out. If you've done your work right, um, you should be able to just about pull that pin out of there and it not come out. It's rare, but this is the way that I was taught to do it, and I believe that that's the right way to do it. So that's what I go with. Now, cutting the saddle slot, man. Um, you know, I'm going to get you a little closer here again. Cutting the saddle slot... On, on this guy can be a very daunting task if you've never done that okay you, it, it's not like open heart surgery it's not super complicated but you gotta have the right tools and you gotta have a router with the proper router base and you gotta have a saddle slot jig you know um, you can buy one from Stu Mac you can get them on Amazon or different places on the internet you can get them I bought a cheap one and it works fantastic it's awesome it comes it came with different you notice i don't know if you probably can't tell it says bosch in here that's not from that didn't come with this router that came with this jig they sent different bases with it for like i had one for a, a, a dremel they had one for the bosch and then there was another one that they sent with it. and i can't remember what it was but i'm not going to use it but um and i'm just using a like a straight cut bit that that's that measures roughly the measurement of the slot that I want. This bit is a little bit bigger than I would like it to be, but it's the smallest bit that I could find in all honesty that would fit in here and to, to do this work with. So I work with it. It's fine. Um, but essentially what you do is um, you, you got to get this lined up to where that bit will float right in the saddle slot that you've marked. Remember, you marked that earlier with either your saddlematic or, or, you know, by manually, by manual methods of finding what your scale length was for all the string pads and doing it that way. Either way is fine. Um, then you know where your line's at. Then you have to line up your jig to where your router sits in here and slides in into that jig back and forth exactly where you want it to be. Really scrutinize that, guys. I'm gonna reiterate that just to, I wanna see, I want you guys to see my eyes because I'm dead serious about this. Really scrutinize your how you've lined that up. Like make sure that that bit travels is perfectly like center of that little line that you scribe on there. That bit wants, to, it'll, it'll want to drift from one end to the other, one way or the other, like almost like an X pattern. Don't let it do that. Move that jig around until you get it where it needs to be and then clamp that jig down on the top of the guitar. Keep your leather on there so it doesn't hurt the finish. Clamp her down. Don't real tight. Don't bust the guitar. Just something to hold it in place. It'd be perfectly fine. And make small passes. Lower that router bit just a quarter of a turn on my router's uh, a pretty substantial change. So just a quarter of a turn. Turn it on. You know, lock it down. Turn it on. Nice smooth pass. Turn it off. Unlock it, quarter of a turn, keep going down until you get to the depth that you're supposed to get to, okay? Your next question is probably, well, Rick, how do I know what depth I'm supposed to be at? Your proper saddle depth is defined as follows. It's 1.5 times the thickness of the saddle. Your proper saddle depth is defined by the thickness of your saddle, okay? And 
you can measure that with a caliper. You know, you can use your little, um, I don't know where mine went. You can use your, your digital caliper, you know, and measure the overall height at the, at the peak, which mine's just right at 0 0.3800. So, um, I wonder what that's, 1964s. So you take that 1964s and you add 864s to it. And that's your that's the depth of the, the, the depth of the saddle slot. That's how you get it. It's that simple. It's 1.5 times. So, so it's that measurement plus half as much more. And once you've got it set in there properly, you'll know because when you lay that saddle in there, You'll be able to look and there'll be plenty of saddle protruding out of the out of the bridge. There's a there are specs. I keep coming back to specs. Sonny was big on teaching me to read the specs and go by specs. You need to have specs for everything you do. I'll show you guys here. On my wall, I have notes that I've acquired over years of just, you know, trial and error and talking to other luthiers, working with Sonny Thomas. Um, you know, my fee schedule's up there too, but all these are specs for different guitars. And you notice like on a, on a Gibson acoustic, we'll start with neck relief. I'm at 12 thousandths is a factory spec. Mine's four thousandths. They, I set Gibson super low. PRSs are the same. They, I go by the same specs on this for uh, PRS, Taylor, and Gibson. They can all be set up to play just about as good as an electric guitar. I mean, super low action if that's what you want. You know. Now, Martins can too, but it takes a lot more work to get them there. You're not going to take the standard radius martin guitar you know out of the box and work the saddle and work the nut down and then it play like an electric guitar you there's more work involved um you, you want to have a conversation about that hit me up and we can talk about it but um saddle height protrusion okay that's where we're at here from an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch and that that eighth of an inch is the absolute minimum like the minimum like you cannot have any less than an eighth of an inch of saddle sticking out of that out of that bridge slot. So to reiterate that, when we're talking about these measurements, there's your bridge, there's your saddle slot, and you know this is in I don't know what is this measurement scale here. I don't know where my other ruler went, but we can go with this. You're measuring like that. Let's get my hands right here. You're measuring like that. You know, you want an eighth of an inch. No, nope. <laughs> that's the minimum. That would be for one that's like, you know, super thin and you're using a super, like, uh, okay, essentially, I'll, I'll just level with you guys, I'll tell you. If you're, if you're gonna go with an eighth of an inch measurement, you're dealing with a, with a bridge that you've had to shave down to keep from doing a neck reset. I can explain that to you. If you want me to, call me, send me a message. We can talk about it, but um, there's just a lot to be said there. Um, I don't prefer to do that. I hate doing that, to be honest. I would almost prefer to do a neck reset and do it right and get the geometry right. Um, but sometimes customers are on a budget, and at the end of the day, I give my folks what they want um, to the best of my ability. So if they want me to shave their saddle down, they're going to lose a little bit of that projection we talked about. When you shave your saddle down, that half inch sweet spot measurement from the soundboard to the bottom of the strings is gonna start lowering for every every little bit of material you remove from that bridge and you then you lower that saddle, you're lowering the strings. So it's give and take, you know. I tell my customers, I say, look, if you want super low action, you're gonna give on tone. And if you want tone, you're gonna you're you're, you're gonna have to build your hands up because you're gonna fight with it just a little bit. I mean it's it's not something that has to be drastic but it's not going to play like butter either a guy like me who likes a really light action flat relief like super fast flat neck um my tremoni model's got that wide thin or uh, pattern thin my custom 24 is pattern thin it's like like ibanez flat tight quick action guitars my my taylor acoustic acoustics my martin acoustics i i've got all my guitars set up super low and super fast playing because that's the that's the way i like it and uh, 
I've got a few customers that prefer medium gauge strings and it's like you're playing on a set of railroad tracks to me, but that's what they like. And, and I've got specs for them in my folder that I've wrote down, like this is what they like. So it's super important to keep up with your specs as you go. Every job, write down what you started with, write down what you end up with if the customer likes it. Give them a copy of it, you keep a copy of it, make a folder. Go back to these, because you're gonna run into another customer like that guy eventually. I, I, I see it all the time. So, quick recap. We've got the bridge glued in. Um, you know, we made our bridge, we glued it in, saddle slots cut, and now we're at the point where we have to sculpt the bridge. And sculpting the bridge, we're taking these wings down. Instead of, instead of it being like a plain, flat surface like this, it's gonna be like that. It's gonna have a nice little contour to it on both sides. So that's what we're doing to this guy now. And the easiest way to do it, it's not exactly like um, the, it may not be the, you know, the most traditional way to do it, but this is the way that I've been doing it for years and I've had great results. I, I know what I can get away with on my tools. Uh, I've got a, I've got a little handheld belt sander here, you know, and a vacuum. And I just kind of, I roll it out. I take, I've already done this side. It's, it's contoured. It's not, it's a nice smooth contour. You know, I'm going to do another, we'll do another video segment here just to show you, but it kind of slopes down and out, down and out. This side over here doesn't do that. You notice it's still nice and chunky. It start. I've started on it, but I haven't finished contouring it yet. You can kind of, you can kind of see, like I've got, like there's chunks here that are that are just not even, and it hasn't been sanded or anything. So, the the belt sander does the bulk of the work, and then I come back and I finish sanding it by hand, using little sanding blocks and stuff that are rounded off. You know, kind of get it contoured. Um, and that's that's what's next. And that's gonna, that'll be the conclusion of our, our bridge work um, uh, series here. So stay tuned. Uh, I'll be back in a minute. I'm gonna get set up to show you guys how I do this. It's gonna be a little noisy. Um, that, that sander and that vacuum going at the same time creates a lot of noise. So I won't talk while I'm running my power tools. I'll wait and turn those off so you guys can hear what I'm saying. But I will, I'll make a few passes with the sander so you guys can see on, on video that it is, it's safe. I've got the guitar clamped here on the front, the shoulder here at the front of the bench, and it ain't going anywhere. And where you know PPE, you gotta have keep your eyes and, and mouth protected. You don't want to breathe this stuff in; it's bad for you. Um, and we'll do that next. So I'll check back in in just a second. All right, guys. So we're uh, we're back, and we're going to finish sculpting this side of um, the bridge that I've glued on Rob's Dove and the rough sculpting gets done with the belt sander in my shop. Um, you can do it with a chisel, you can do it with the carving tools. Um, I prefer to use the belt sander because this belt sander for this job, it's almost, it's almost like it was just about made for it. The, the, the profile of that Right there, uh, that end of the belt sanding, uh, sander is just about perfect for this. It's just the right radius and the right size, and I can, can I can control my pressure as I go with this guy a lot better. It seems than I can with chisels and and you know hand carving tools. I have the tendency personally. I don't know. Maybe some of you guys are the same way. Maybe you're not. But I have the tendency when I'm using my chisels to get a little overzealous at times and I pull out too much material. With this, I can watch myself as I go and I can measure as I go. I'll take my caliper, uh, my dial caliper here and, and uh, or my chronometer, whatever you wanna call it. As I go in the bottom side, I will, I'll take that little part that protrudes right there will tell the tale of how 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 much material I've got and how much I've took off. And the way I do that is I zero it out, like we said before, on a piece of granite. And 
and then I go over here and I go down all the way down to the soundboard. So on, on this side, we're at 3 16 uh, That's a good round measurement. If you're one of those guys that likes to read things in frac uh, decimal, we can do that too. Had too much coffee to got day guys on a little jittery. We're, uh, well, all right, let's get back over here and try again. My caliper's being stubborn. I apologize, we're having technical difficulties here. Here we go. Now in decimals, we're at like 0.175 inches on that end, or right through this area right here. Now on the very end down here, which would be the lowest point on the saddle, we are 0 0.200, okay? So um, that's good. I'm good with that. It's nice and even. Yep. Got a little more meat through here. I need to come back and take that off in a minute. I might, might use a chisel to take it. It's a little thick through here. It's thicker here than it is here. And see, that's the importance of using these tools. They won't lie to you. But like, if, to put this into perspective, measuring here, well, if I do the same thing over here, we are at 276, where over here, we're at, uh, what did I say before? 183. 182, yeah, 182. So, I mean, there's a, almost a 200, or I'm sorry, a hundred thousandths of, of difference there by this micrometer. So we've got some work to do. And as promised, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk while I'm running this, this power sander. I'll come back and talk to you guys as, as I stop. So just bear with me here. This is, it's a neat little process and I wanted to share that with y'all, so. on right now so it may be a little muffled but I'm gonna save I'm gonna save this ebony dust on here because I gotta have that to do filling work later on might seem trivial but let me tell you when you need this stuff you need it and there ain't no replacement for real ebony dust on an ebony surface and it you'll end up using a lot more of this when you're new to guitar work than you will throughout you know as a, as a uh, seasoned guitar tech or luthier or whatever and uh it's always a good idea to have plenty of that on hand because when you need it you need it i i know i've already said that but i man you gotta have this stuff and you gotta have it <laughs> Essentially, what we do is we kind of get it close. We get it close to where it needs to be, and then we measure. 
get her clamped back up. Her little clamp fell off here. Huh. Man, that'll hold. Um, so we get it close. So I compare it to the other side again. Always, you always want to zero up your uh, your measurement tool on a good known flat surface, which this piece of granite's it's dead flat. So one six four this time is what we're reading, and it was somewhere through here. So we're at two sixteen versus. 171, 1232. So we're, we're closing the gap, but we still got some, some ways to go here. So I'll make a pass or two more and we should be where we need to be to, to finish it up by hand. Doesn't take long, you'll acquire a lot of that dust, so. <laughs> All right, folks, so we'll check one more time and see where we're at. And I know this seems like it's just a big, time consuming, drawn out deal, but. If you're wanting to do this stuff and you're watching this video, it's worth watching until the end because the end result's what matters. So I'm within uh, about 40 thousandths of where I need to be now. So from here, I like to do it, I like to finish it by hand. I like to do what I gotta do by hand from here. And I usually use just sandpaper and kind of sculpt it by hand. Um, it, it seems to work out better for me this way. So, you know, a little sanding block, piece of sandpaper. Um, I like to take and wrap that over so I get that nice rounded contoured shape. And safety first, guys. Got to mask up.
piece of sandpaper is about half better days, I believe, folks. Looking pretty good. Now, I know this camera isn't really doing it justice, but I'm trying. That's all I can do is try. I hope that you can see that sharp ledge right there. And there's still a lot of, a lot of, a lot of material in this end, this little ear here. And the front edges look about even, but this, this has got to come down and that's got to be smoothed out. It needs to be a smooth transition all the way across. So that's where we're heading with this. Not, I feel like at this point, you guys kind of get the idea of what we're doing. I'm not going to bore you with this on video, but um, after you do this, then the bridge is done, man. You're, you're, you need to go through the grits on your sandpaper. Once you get the profile that you like and you've got it sculpted like you want it, uh, you need to hit it with something that's about a medium grade sandpaper. Work your way up from, I'm working, I'm not, no kidding, I'm working with like 180, 80 grit, 100 grit sandpaper right now just to get the material off there. I'll step up to like a 200, two, um, 220, maybe a 320, probably 320 from here. And then I'll go to like 600 grit and I'll, I'll stop there. Cause I don't want it to be too slick and shiny just yet because uh, i've got other work to do and it'd be pointless to get it to that point and if you if you scar the bridge uh you have to come back and sand it anyhow so i'll wait and do that right before i oil it with oiled linseed oil the last thing you do when you install rosewood or ebony um and i what i try to do is do it all in one step i usually do that as part of part of my bench service like when i when i service the guitar on my bench i clean the whole thing up anyhow I use boiled linseed oil for rosewood and ebony. Uh, now I'll use lemon oil for those same products if the if it's a if it's an, uh, a newer instrument. But if it's like this raw wood, let me back up and say that again a different way. If it, if it's raw wood that's never that I know has never been treated, I'm using boiled linseed oil because it puts a protective finish type layer in, on the oil, on the wood. It, it'll protect the wood. Lemon oil will do the same thing, but it's so much thinner. Like it just, it doesn't really build. You know, linseed oil is actually, you can actually use linseed oil as a finish. You can French polish with it. it. It takes a lot of coating with it to get it there, but you can, you can use it as a finish. Um, I like to use linseed oil, so I, it'll get linseed oil treatment. And then that'll happen when I do the fretboard too. I'll do it all in one step, but 600 grits where I'll stop. And and that's going to be that. But I think this concludes our little series here on bridge work. And I feel pretty confident that I've covered all the bases here as far as making a new bridge from a blank. Um, as, be as best as I can without showing you in the video. But um, I would really like to come back and revisit this later on when I've got another one of these jobs to do. And I may do that. But I want to get this up just to kind of get some more activity going in on social media and and you know, YouTube and all that. So, um, if you guys have any questions, you know, I, you can call me. Um, if I don't answer, leave a voicemail. I'll call you back. Uh, leave, shoot me a message on my website. Go to, uh, go to my, my, my website, baritonestreamworks.com. There's a chat box in there. If you, if you, if you send me uh, a message on there, I, I get it that quick. It's just instant. So I'll, I'll respond as soon as I can. I, I may be at work and I may be away from my phone, uh, but I'll respond as soon as I can. So, uh, yeah, any questions, man? Any, 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 it may, hey, if you got suggestions on improvement on, on this process, I'm all ears. I love to learn. So, I'm an empty, I'm an empty vessel, man. I've learned stuff from people that's been doing this for a year. I've learned stuff about this that people have, have, have been doing this their entire lives, like Sonny. Everybody, everybody's got knowledge to share. So, share your knowledge, man. Spread love. Um, and, Take care of each other and um, come and see us sometime. We'll be glad to help you out if we can on a guitar, you know, string in instrument repair. And uh, take care. Till next time. Peace.